Fritz Haber is probably the most important scientist you've never heard of. He may have just saved the world with his research. In fact, three billion people each year are on this earth because of what he's developed. At the same time, his research has been used to make gunpowder and to more effectively kill people with Welcome to Real Chemistry, I'm Dr. Morris. Today we're gonna to be talking about Fritz Haber. Let's start with the good news. How did Fritz Haber save the world? Well, it all has to do with the chemical element nitrogen. Nitrogen turns out to come in many forms. So there's nitrogen in the atmosphere all around us. Every time we breathe, 80% of that is nitrogen. There's nitrogen in our bodies. It makes up our DNA, our genetic code, and it makes up our proteins, which are, of course, important in our muscles, but also in all sorts of little cool chemical micro machines throughout our body, the original nanotechnology. So nitrogen is really important, and living organisms need it. Humans need it, animals need it, and so do plants. Plants have DNA, and plants have proteins, and so they need nitrogen. When you plant things, you provide them with this nitrogen with fertilizer. There are very few plants that can actually take the nitrogen from the atmosphere and use it. That nitrogen is really different, and we'll get to that in a second. So Fritz Haber knew that nitrogen was really important for fertilizer, and so he began working on developing nitrogen that can be used for plants from the abundant nitrogen in the atmosphere. And about 10 years before World War I, so this is the early 1900s, he was successful. He developed a process that was economical that could produce tons of nitrogen for plants. Why do we care? Well, without plants, we die, obviously. In fact, 7 billion people on Earth right now that we have to feed, 3 billion of them would die, would not have enough nitrogen from plants to live. So Fritz Haber's development saved 3 billion people by developing a process to take the nitrogen in the air and put it into a form usable by plants. Now, it's called the Bosch-Haber process because another scientist, Bosch, came along and scaled it up so that it could be done at a large-scale commercial level. So that's how he saved the world, the development of fertilizer that can now be used for endless, endless farms. On the other hand, this same process, which makes high-energy nitrogen, takes nitrogen from the air, which turns out to be in low energy, and creates really high-energy nitrogen in the form of ammonia, can actually be used to make explosives. That's right. So gunpowder, for example, contains nitrogen. Uh, TNT contains nitrogen. And here's what the nitrogen is kind of like when it's in an explosive. This guy is really high up. He's swinging back and forth. At any moment, he may fall off of that line and plummet. Here is the nitrogen in explosives. It's called a nitrate. And nitrate has a single nitrogen and it's attached to three oxygens. So you can see here the lines between the nitrogen and the oxygens. If there's a single line there, it's called a single bond, and that line represents a bond which holds those two atoms together. If you see two lines, that's called a double bond, and it's an even stronger glue that holds those atoms together. So the stronger that glue, the more stable it is. Here's the nitrogen in air. Three lines, a triple bond, really, really stable. So the nitrogen in gunpowder can be thought of as like the, at the top of a waterfall. And the nitrogen in the atmosphere can be thought of as at the bottom of that same waterfall. And in general, what things want to do is flow from high energy to low energy. And so what that means is, is if you provide an ignition source, that high energy nitrogen will combust. And you'll get an explosive. And so Fritz Haber's process was adapted for uses in explosives during World War I. The Germans needed a supply of high energy nitrogen. The Allies knew this, and they created a blockade to prevent them from importing this nitrogen from South America. And so the Germans turned to the Bosch Haber process to produce high energy nitrogen that they could use in their explosives. Now that you're more familiar with nitrogen, let's take a look at the actual Bosch Haber process. What you're looking at is called a chemical reaction. And the things on the left side are called reactants. That's like what you put into a reaction. You can see there that it has an N2. That's actually the nitrogen in the air. So that nitrogen is the very same nitrogen, which has a triple bond, those three lines between the two nitrogens, making it really stable. And what we get out of a chemical reaction, we put on the right side of that arrow called the products. There you see that NH3. NH3, on the other hand, the ammonia you get out of the Bosch-Haber process looks like this. It's a nitrogen 
with single bonds to all those hydrogens. So now you can see what Bosch-Haber has done in this chemical reaction. He's taken really stable nitrogen and made a really high energy form of nitrogen because of those single bonds. And that means it can be used in explosives or incorporated into things like proteins and plants. So on the one hand, we see in Fritz Haber, someone who has made something that we really love. <laughs> he feeds billions, that's awesome. On the other hand, he's developed something that was used for warfare, that kills people. And Fritz Haber's legacy is made more complicated by his role in chemical weapons. During World War I, he worked on developing chemical weapons that were predecessors to the chemical weapons used in World War II in Nazi Germany. He even came up with something called Haber's Rule, a twisted use of science if there ever was one, which shows that you can use less toxic gas for a shorter amount of time to still kill people. So it's how you can pinch those pennies when you're murdering massive numbers of people. So what's so interesting about Fritz Haber is that he captures all in one person the idea that science can be used for wonderful good to save people. 50% of the nitrogen in your body right now comes from the Bosch Haber process. So you owe a debt to this development. At the same time, he's used science to kill and to destroy. And so what this highlights for us as a society is that we always have to ask with science, not just can we do it, not just is it cool, but ought we do it? Is this something that leads to life or something that leads to death? Now it sounds like a simple question and it is simple in the case of chemical warfare. Don't develop chemical weapons. It seems like a pretty clear rule to me. However, it's more complicated when we think about all of the varied scientific research we do today. For example, should we develop brain electronic interfaces. That sounds cool. I can access the internet 24-7. Okay, is that good or bad? This is a question that we must ask before we pursue research. But we can get so distracted, and is this, this is cool, we can get so distracted by science saving us that we forget as a society to ask, ought we to use science in this way? So remember, always ask, is this a good use of science or a bad use of science? Science is powerful, but we have to be wise. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry.